Uh, welcome to those of you that have joined us. We're going to probably go about 30 minutes this morning and then leave it open if there's a little bit of questions or, or uh, some clarification that you want to see here at the end. Uh, so again, to all of those that are in the system here in the upper right-hand corner of your screen in that go to webinar menu, uh, please feel free to use that question tool. Send me any comments or questions or things you'd like me to uh, uh, review here while we're talking specifically today about running illustrations uh, for Index Universal Life and solving for income. So before I get started, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Eric Palmer. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Brokers Alliance. So if we haven't had the pleasure to meet or talk yet, I welcome you to the program and, and we appreciate you jumping in here and spending some time with us. Uh, for everybody else, it's, it's great to see you again and, and we do thank you for attending these, these uh, training sessions. I think they're helpful and, and uh, I want to encourage everybody to let us know what else you want to see covered. We've got a lineup here of uh, uh, subject matter over the next couple of weeks. But um, if there's something you want us to cover specifically, shoot me an email or talk to your marketing representative here at Brokers Alliance and let us know what else we can do in these presentations to help you be more successful out there in the field. Um, but with that, I do want to focus in on the illustration today. So what you see on the screen here is the Income for Life uh, uh, IFLAgents.com web portal, which is the administrative portal that you all have access to. And if I click down here at IFL member login and, and actually log into the program, and we'll recognize all of you individually. And of course, uh, you'll see that it uh, tells you you're logged in appropriately here. It says logged in as Eric Palmer. And when I go into the IFL training, which is the upper right-hand corner here, I'm going to get access to a variety of different videos and tools. And again, what I want to hone in on today is the WinFlex web tool. So um, when you get to the IFL training page, what you want to do is scroll down about uh, halfway here to the middle, and you'll see just below all the videos, there's a series of links uh, under the marketing tools header. And uh, right in the dead center at the bottom of the links here, as you can see on your screen, I'm hovering my mouse over it, it says WinFlex Web Illustration Program. And when you click that, it's going to actually launch the WinFlex Web tool. So everybody has access to this. If for any reason you don't have your login or your information, just contact uh, your marketing representative here at Brokers Alliance. They'll help coordinate that uh, with Bethany Braun, who is uh, um, our onboarding specialist, and she'll make sure that you have that information. So I'm going to go ahead and log into my WinFlex web portal here. I'm going to show you kind of how it looks as we get into the system. Um, you're going to get two options once you log into WinFlex web. The first one is going to ask you if you actually want to use um, the uh, actual web tool or if you want to use WinFlex web express. Um, I use the first one here where it says start WinFlex web. You want the full illustration software, especially because we're solving for income and, and making a few different uh, 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 tweaks into the illustration to maximize income and solve for, for a better equation for our clients. So once this loads, you're going to get a little pop-up box like you see here on your screen, and that's going to give you access to all the insurance companies that you're licensed with through Brokers Alliance, and obviously your list might look a little bit different than mine, but um, you will have access to the companies that you've licensed here at Brokers Alliance, which uh, uh, is something you want to keep an eye out for on your first time getting into the system, because you're going to want to make sure, of course, that you are um, seeing the companies that you want to run illustrations for. Um, for today's example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into Genworth. You know, I've, I've been talking about Genworth quite a bit, but uh, as I continue to, to explore the landscape here with Index Universal Life Insurance products, I'm gravitating towards a, just a couple of companies, and Genworth's one of them, uh, specifically because they've designed what I believe is one of the best IULs in the market when it comes to solving for income and, and uh, their corporate philosophy uh, excuse me, philosophy lends to this tax-free uh, retirement planning process, and, and uh, it's important that the insurance companies are on board with what we're doing because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to be backing up our clients when it comes time for them to, to call into policy owner services and, and trigger these, these loans. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on Genworth, and then you'll see that all the products pop up on the right-hand side. The Accumulation Index Universal Life we want to work with for them and this particular example is called the Asset Builder, and it's actually the first one on the list. So make sure that's highlighted, and then you click on Create Client. What that's going to do, it's going to open up the portal specifically for that insurance company, and you'll see a series of tabs across the top here that are going to help you run this illustration and put this information together. So again, just a very simple process to get into the software. What's so great about WinFlex Web as a tool is that you don't have to download 17 different insurance companies' worth of software. Um, you can access this at, through any portal so long as you have uh, uh, Java enabled on your uh, computer, laptop, or tablet, and, of course, you have your login to, to get into the system. 
So what I want to kind of explore today is I'm going to look at a few different things. We had a, a really successful um, uh, index road show not too long ago. We had uh, about 32 of our IFL agents out there. Uh, for those of you that are on the call, uh, welcome back to, to your hometown, and, and we do, again, appreciate you, you joining us here in Arizona to do a little bit of a training. And uh, that's not going to be the only one we do. So everybody on the call now uh, that has not uh, been able to come out to Arizona for one of our live training sessions, keep your eyes out because we'll be sending you uh, schedules uh, going into 2015 of when we'll be hosting some additional live training sessions. And, and uh, I think that uh, those that were are on the call that were here would agree that uh, it was uh, something that uh, provided everybody just a little bit of information they could take back and, and, and grow their practice with. So um, I, I do encourage everybody to attend. But uh, what's nice about uh, those sessions is that it gives us a lot of feedback on what you guys are facing out in the field. And one of the things that kind of came up is, is, you know, when I run across lump sums of money, whether it's $100,000 or $200,000, qualified or non-qualified, you know, how do you structure, what's the best way to fund the IUL in order to see a decent income at the end? So what I want to look at in this first round of illustrations is I'm going to take a 50-year-old, and we're going to look at a um, $100,000 lump sum, and I'm going to fund it in a couple of different ways here to show you what the end results look like so you can get an understanding of, um, first of all, how to use this illustration software to appropriately uh, show those types of premium funding strategies but also to see the results of a three pay versus a seven pay um, in, in these types of situations and how to avoid making the contract so that we can continue to take out a, a tax-free loan from these policies and achieve our goals with our client. So let's get up towards the top here. We're going to call this person Sam Smith. Sam's, as I said, 50 years old. And uh, we're going to go with a preferred non-tobacco for Sam because he actually took care of himself here and uh, uh, stayed somewhat healthy throughout uh, his years of life. Um, on this first screen, it's some basic information. You're really just identifying who the insured is. So uh, you can put in the age or the date of birth, but here I just use the age. Um, on that rate class, you know, preferred non-tobacco, a lot of times when we meet our clients, and I do want to reiterate this, make sure that we are uh, field underwriting. You know, if I'm sitting across the table from Sam, and Sam weighs 320 pounds and he's six foot one, I'm probably not going to run him at preferred. And these are things that we have to pay attention to. Make sure you have uh, access to the health questionnaires and fact finders that we use for health so that you can get a little bit of a pulse on what rate class you should be running with these clients. Um, there's no flat extras in this particular scenario, obviously, but um, uh, do keep in mind this is the area that you put that in there. State of issue for this example is just leave it at Arizona, and we're going to let, let the rest of this stuff default. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to click over on the Solve 4 tab, and this is an important part. So what we want to do when we're solving with these IULs is we want to solve for minimum death benefit. We want to make sure that our face amount, our, our actual insurance amount is as low as possible because we want to keep the cost of insurance low. We want to keep the cost out of the contract when our purpose for running this illustration is to maximize what we can take out in terms of loans. So I'm going to drop the solve and I'm going to drop it and I'm going to say face amount. And that's going to open up a couple of options here at the bottom. So before I get into actually putting the premium amount is, I want to show you this face solve option here. Okay. So I'm going to jump down again, face solve option. Right now it defaults with the Genworth uh, part of WinFlex Web to minimum non-MEC seven pay premium. Okay, but when I hit this, you got target, you got maximum, you got solve for cash value and guideline premium. These are all the different ways that the software is going to determine how to solve for that face amount. We want to stay with minimum non-MEC seven pay. And what that's telling the system to do is give me the absolute least amount of death benefit for the amount of premium I'm going to put into this contract, but don't MEC it. We're staying within the seven pay guidelines. And so we're, we're, we don't want to uh, uh, violate our Tamra and DEFRA uh, corridors, but we also want to make sure that, again, we're buying as little as we can when it comes to death benefit for the dollars going in. I like to run annual premium modes, although this is something that you can certainly put in uh, monthly. Uh, but for my, you know, beginning stages, and especially when we're running uh, this for customization on the IFL calculators, you're, you're going to want to stick to an annual premium mode uh, for the first go around here with your client. So what I'm going to do first here is I'm going to click on this more button because we don't want to just put premium in every single year. We're going to solve for a scenario where this individual at age 50 wants to take income at age 68. Okay, so I've got 18 years to let this thing percolate, and that's also going to come into play here when I get into my index strategy, so keep that in mind. But what I want to do here is 
I'm going to tell the system, and you, and you should see this pop-up menu uh, when I clicked on the more, more button. I'm going to tell the system to solve from age 50, and we're going to start out to age 55. Okay, so what, or excuse me, I'm going to go backward, uh, age 53. So we're going to fund this premium for three years. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide that $100,000 up into three premium payments. And for simple math, uh, we're just going to use 33000 to begin with. Okay, so not quite $100,000, but um, I think you'll, you'll, you'll see the point here. So again, this is an individual, get Sam, at 50 years old, we're going to assume Sam had $100,000 of non-qualified money. Uh, sitting in a CD, we're going to show them an alternative here of how to take that and turn it into a potential income stream. So we tell it from age 50 to age 53, for three years we want $33,000 going in. And then what we're going to do is we're going to hit the tab button on it and it's going to take us to a new line and we're going to tell the system 54 to forever, we don't want to put any more premiums. So that's going to be a zero. And I'm going to hit the OK button here. Next, what I want to do is I'm going to go into the index strategy. And we're going to keep this one simple. We're going to say, let's leave it in the one year cap-based strategy, that's the annual point-to-point -point with the S&P 500 uh, uh, with Genworth. 100% of the premium is allocated to that strategy, but I'm going to change this interest assumption. So remember back to uh, some of the other trainings, and again, for those of you that were at our index show, the, the, the comparison chart that we talked about and the probabilities charts that we talk about. You know, if I've got 30 years on a 30-year look back, 8.34% might be appropriate. But in this case, I'm going to solve for income at age 68. So I've got 18 years. So I'm going to dial that way back. Uh, for this instance, I'm going to use 7%. Okay. And so I'm going to change that to a 7, as you can see. And then I'm going to jump into the next screen. Okay. So the rest of this we're going to leave alone because we're at, we've already allocated 100% of our premium to this one strategy. Now, just for future knowledge, you can blend this in. You can use a little bit of money in different buckets, but we're going to keep it simple here just for today's example. So my next move here is I'm going to click over on policy options, and this is where we're going to talk about um, how we want this death benefit to perform. So as we know, there's some different uh, tricks that we can use to, um, again, maximize the cash value growth and uh, minimize that death benefit once we really start taking income. We want to control costs on the contract. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my death benefit option here to option B, which is level plus your cash value. It's going to change that corridor amount and allow that cash value to push it up. And then you see this little trigger that popped up here. It says DB option change in the optimal year. I'm going to leave that checked as yes. So what that's telling us, or what that's telling WinFlex to do is in the optimal year, which is usually right around the year that we start taking the loans, it's going to switch from this option two death benefit to an option one. And it's automatically going to determine, determine the optimal point in time for that to happen. So you don't have to do the math or, or run nine different illustrations. It's going to solve it for you. Under insurance test, we're going to leave it under the guideline premium test. Okay, and we'll do that with Genworth here on all the illustrations that we solve for income. And we want to make sure that it is continued to, to say yes uh, as a prevent mech. We do not want to mech this contract. So by making sure that this is checked yes, the system will return an error if in any of your solves uh, you actually created a mech on the contract. So what it's essentially saying is WinFlex won't let you run the illustration if it ends up being a mech. And that's important because, again, we're talking to our clients about tax-free income. We don't want to mech this contract. Now, in this instance, we're not putting in any lump sums or 1035s, but this is the area that you would be doing it in inside the WinFlex uh, web software. Um, this is not a revised illustration, so you leave that checked as no. Um, illustration checklist is just a part of the, the output, so that's going to tell us that uh, we've covered all our bases on the, on the forms and everything that's going to be included. And you can leave the second half uh, or the bottom half here uh, defaulted as well. I'm going to click on disbursements, and this is where we're actually going to solve for the income, solve for the, the tax-free loan that we're going to take out of this policy. So we're going to tell it, first of all, yes, we want to take a disbursement. And what I'm going to do is it, it defaults to get under disbursement amount here on this checkbox to solve for max. And there's a, uh, usually only one option here, and it is solve for max. But what I want to do is I want to click on the more button again, because remember, we don't want to take loans right away. So we're going to say from age uh, 50 to age 67, we're going to take zero in terms of a disbursement because we're going to fund those three years and then we're going to let this thing sit and cook. So from age 68, 
until max, which in this case with general is age 120, I want the system to solve for the maximum loan that I can take from this policy, okay? So we're going to say, again, from 50 to age 67, we don't want to take any money out from age 68 and on. We're going to take the maximum amount per year based on that rate of return that we're running, and I'm going to click OK. Now, this will target a cash value of $1,000. Leave that just like it is, okay? What it's essentially saying is, is what does your uh, endow number look like? What do you want that thou uh, cash value to look like at its end game? Uh, typically, $1,000 is the minimum in these software uh, uh, pieces of software, but you can solve for a different number as well. That would be some very specific planning, so typically, I always encourage you just to leave it at 1000 And again, leave your target cash value year at 100 So, or excuse me, at, at lifetime. Now, disbursement option is important. What we want to do is, in this case, we want to solve for loans. Now, there's different ways you can do this. You can take withdrawals of basis and switch over to a loan after you've taken the basis out of the contract. Um, you can solve uh, for, for just withdrawals uh, so that all you're doing is withdrawing uh, basis and or potentially uh, uh, returns, which could create a little taxation. But because we want to maximize the dollars, we're going to use loans in this case. And the kind of loan we want to use is right here under loan type. We're going to use the participating loan in this example. Now, I've, I've talked about this before. I always encourage you to run both of these for your clients so they understand the difference between the two types of loans. It's, it's our responsibility, of course, as insurance agents to make sure our clients know what this policy can do for them. But again, in this example, I'm going to use a participating loan, and I'm going to leave the participating loan interest rate at 4.75%. And I want that loan to come out annually. Okay, because I'm using an annual premium, I'm going to show an annual loan, again, to make things simple for our clients to understand. Now, the rest of these tabs may not come into play in most instances, and in this instance, it's not going to come into play for us at all, but I do want to review them real quick. So we have policy riders. If I did want to add a rider, you can see they're kind of grayed out here, but if I check yes, it brings them to life. We could add accelerated benefit for long-term care services. Uh, we can add accidental death benefit, child riders, and waiver of monthly deduction. Now, the reason I'm not checking off the accelerated benefit rider for long-term care services is sort of a personal preference, preference and something I talked about uh, on some previous trainings. But in my opinion, when you're talking about income with a client, you're doing retirement planning, um, what the client's focused on is the output. What you know, If I put money in, what's going to come out of this thing, and is it going to be a decent return for me based on what my anticipated life expectancy is? Well, if we add a long-term or accelerated benefit option into this policy, then we're clouding the waters because we have to keep in mind that these accelerated benefits are going to change that income. If our clients survive a chronic illness or a critical illness and they take a benefit out of these policies, that's going to change what that income or that loan amount could be, uh, therefore potentially derailing them from their ultimate plan. So you really got to do some additional planning before you just add those benefits in and make sure that the client is, is in complete understanding of the effects of accelerated benefit riders and what the cost uh, really can be inside the contract. Under supplements, this is where you uh, can talk about the different information that you want to be uh, or you want to have included in the illustration. I usually leave it at the default, although you can include this internal rate of return uh, ledger, which is pretty nice sometimes when you're showing your clients uh, the effects of cash value versus other things like CDs and other types of investments. Uh, policy versus alternative strategies, that's a different one, again, that you can include. Um, they're all a little bit different. Uh, you can include different historical returns, lookbacks, and, and so on and so forth. So um, these are just different reports that can help you with your sales process. But again, for our purposes today, I'm just going to leave it at the default. I usually skip over the home office tab because it really doesn't matter, although uh, if you had a specific distribution code, you'd put it in there. It's really not going to uh, play uh, a role here in anything that you guys are working on. Uh, then you're going to get to agent information. You're going to want to make sure that, you know, whoever you are, is you're on the illustration so that when you're showing your client this stuff, um, they understand, of course, how to get a hold of you, who you are, and uh, it makes the actual illustration a little bit more professional. And also keep in mind, during the sales process, irregardless of the fact that we're using um, the, the uh, IFL calculators to tell our story, we have to 100% be using... Uh, the carrier illustration software and illustration output as well to make our sale. The client has to see these illustrations. That's where the disclosures are. They have to sign it at the end on the final illustration, that, and it's also included in their policy. So make sure that we are not abandoning uh, the use of the illustrations here in this IFL process. 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go up to the top and I'm going to click on calculate. And we're going to let this thing cook and let's see what happens here. So again, remember, uh, just to review, I'm going to do a three pay. I'm putting $33,000 a year uh, in for three years. And I'm taking income out using the variable loan or the participating loan, as they call it here, uh, to maximize the income value from age 68 to 120. Now, it might take just a little bit of a, a time here. You'll see it says calculating in the corner, so we're going to give it just a second. It's, it's thinking pretty hard here, as we, obviously we're, we're running some numbers. And again, while that's running, I want to encourage everybody, um, send me any comments or questions if you have anything you want to see me specifically illustrate. This one's thinking extra hard today. It must be a, 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 the Wednesday morning, uh, the, the hump day uh, thought process for WinFlex Web. It'll probably take just another minute. This is always where you want to work on your uh, conversation fillers while you're sitting down with your clients. Of course, you uh, uh, can never anticipate how long our software is going to take. There we go. All right, so what we'll see here is that when your illustration comes out, if it did run successfully, you, you will not see any error messages, and you'll get this little line here where it tells you what you ran. It actually tells you what your target premium is, so keep that in mind. Um, target premium is $13,444 in this particular case. Policy is guaranteed for 15 years. But what I like to do is I click right here on this little PDF icon. You can see me hovering the mouse over it. And when I click on that, it's going to open up this illustration in another window, and we're going to be able to see our output. So, again, one of the things that I, I've talked about in the past, you know, uh, about um, uh, Genworth is the fact that I really like their the first page of the output here. Um, I think that it really helps us skip past uh, searching through these illustrations and get right down to the, to the nitty-gritty of what we're trying to do for our clients. Okay, so what we basically said is that, we put in $33,000, and actually, this solved a uh, four pay. Um, so I'm going to go backward here and change things a little bit real quick. I'm going to back up on my software. I'm going to close this out. I put in too many years here. There we go, 52. There we go. So now we got to wait again. But essentially, um, um, it counts the first year of the age that you put in. So I should, of course, uh, uh, have edited at age 52. So age 50, 51, and 52, we're going to put in the $33,000 a year. Okay, so I'm going to hit the icon again. We're going to open this thing up. It should look right now at this point. And again, right here on the first page, what we see is a really nice display of uh, the outputs that we're going to get from this policy. So again, we ran it uh, so that we would have th uh, three years of premium in. I'm going to scroll down to our ledger so we can actually look at this from a life insurance standpoint as well. Although again, I, as I mentioned, I really like that first page. And it looks like we lost our distribution. So I'm having technical difficulties this morning here. I'm going to edit it one more time, guys. Sometimes when you go in, by the way, this is a good little lesson for us to learn. When we change our premium mode, like I just did, remember I went in and I changed the year here on premium. I click OK. Sometimes we, we lose the distribution uh, components that we put in here. So I'm going to go back to disbursements. I'm going to click on more. Um, let's see. I told it to solve for max, age 68.
So this, so this is basically telling me that I cannot take disbursements on a three pay. So this is a good exercise here. Um, essentially, that's probably because of the age of the client and the amount of uh, premium that I'm solving for. Let me just take another quick look at what I'm doing here. So what this is, is doing essentially is it's exercising its overloan privileges. And I, we had a question about a three pay. Now, just so just to be clear, I don't typically do three pays, so I'm going to edit this. It's not going to let me do it. Um, let's start with a five pay. But I, there was a mention of a of a three pay in the, in the audience, so I do want to make sure we come back to that here at a different time. But I'm going to do a five pay in this scenario now, just to move things along here. So I'm going to take that hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to make it twenty thousand dollars. That's you know the hundred thousand we started with, but we're going to put it in for five years. I click OK. We'll go back to my disbursements. Make sure everything looks right. So we're taking income at age 68. Let's see if we can get this thing to work for us now. And again, for the individual that asked uh, about the three pay, uh, if you want to shoot me a, uh, a separate note about how you were running those illustrations um, and avoiding Mac, just let me know. Uh, we can review that uh, at a different time. But again, in this example, guys, uh, just to keep things moving along, I'm going to use a five pay. So we put 20 grand in a year for five years. We're solving for max income, starting at age 68, using a 7% rate of return uh, average in the policy here. All right. So our target premium went down, of course, because we put less in a year. We had $8,195 at target premium. I'm going to click on the PDF symbol. And here we go. Okay, so what we're going to see is that if I put $20,000 in for five years or $100,000 of premium, we're going to get out of this policy $18,803 in loan distributions a year starting at age 68. And we told it to solve to 120, so if the client does live for 53 more years, they'll take almost a million dollars out of the policy. So not a bad return. But let's scroll down now and look at what that means for um, uh, more realistic terms. What does it look like in terms of uh, income at the appropriate age of uh, life expectancy? And so I'm going to scroll down almost to the end here where the ledger starts. And we're going to take a look at this thing from a different standpoint. And one of the things I like about the generous illustration is they always show you the non-guaranteed value 1% lower than where you started. So it's going to give us what happens at 6% and what happens at 7% in this particular example. So our client puts in the $20,000 a year for the five years. We start taking income at age 68. We see it right here, uh, $18,803. Or if we got a 6% rate of return, it's $10,000 a year. So we have to go, first of all, look for our clients. What's going to happen at, at – um, or at what point are we getting a, re a return on our investment? And somewhere around here, age 74, age 75. So our clients are going to clearly get a return at the 7% of their principal or what they put into the policy on a tax-free basis. And then they're also, also going to have, of course, this death benefit left over. But let's move down towards the life expectancy years. You can see here after age 79, we've taken 225000 of tax-free income um, for the uh, $100,000 that the client invested in the policy. And there's still some death benefit left over as we continue on. And let's go to age 88, 89, which is kind of the high end of life expectancy, um, especially for females. We're taking somewhere about four times what he's put in on a tax-free basis. And keep in mind, when we use those illustrations with um, or the calculators with the IFL program, we can display to the client how much that would have uh, had to be if it was a qualified plan, how much money would have had to have been in there to actually net 413,666 of of tax-free income um, or after-tax income when it comes to a qualified plan. So this is the end result here, of course, of putting in that five pay and, and skipping many years to let it let it sit and bake. Now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to run this as a 10 pay. And a lot of times we get the question of, well, would that increase or de decrease the income? So let's take a look at what happens here. But again, remember, at five pay, using the 7%, we got $18,803 out of this policy for our clients. 
Never also forget to include uh, the death benefit in your discussions because this is a life insurance policy. So not only are we providing this, this source of income here, but we're giving them an end result, an end game here, if they pass away at any given point. So include that, especially when you're looking at what kind of rate of returns we're getting for these clients. So I'm going to click Edit in the software. I'm going to go into Disbursements here. Um, uh, excuse me, into uh, Solve 4 again. I'm going to change my premium amount to $10,000. For 10 years. I'm going to click OK. Just make sure my disbursement still looks good. I'm taking an age 68 income. OK. And let's calculate. And what I'll show you here on this illustration is too to help kind of define why the results are going to come out the way they are is we're going to take a look at the cost of insurance page as well. And, and again, uh, with, when you run Genworth, the cost of insurance page is automatically included in, this, in the software and in, in the illustration output. Um, for North American, we've got to tell it to include the COI pages. Um, and the same goes for a majority of the IUL carriers. We usually got to tell it to include uh, that actual analysis for us because it doesn't automatically happen inside the software. Uh, so make sure you're doing that, as I showed you before, where you can include those different reports. Okay. So, of course, at $10,000 a year, our, our, our uh, target premium was cut in half. But let's take a look at what this thing is going to do for our client. So it's actually not too bad. We got a little bit more income out of this policy. Let's take a look at why that happened. I'm going to jump down. to the ledger and let's take a look. So we're putting $10,000 in here in a year. We're taking 1897 or excuse me, 18.974 out of the policy if we put in a 10 pay. So why is it slightly higher? That's a question I get and it's a couple thousand dollars actually higher on the 6% rate of return. Well, the big part of this is, is those initial years of premium lows and I'm going to jump into this cost of insurance. So keep something in mind now. We're, we're, when we saw these illustrations and we, we take these rate of returns, we're working against a stream, and that stream is these three categories we see here. Okay, We've got the premium expense charges, cost of insurance, and other policy charges and fees. Okay, So there's a couple things that come into play. First of all is what the initial specified death benefit amount is. That's going to affect what our COIs are going into this policy. But also we have this premium expense charge. Now. I'm going to go back and I'm going to show you this premium expense charges and things here for these, uh, for putting $20,000 in a year. So even though we have more premium working on the rate of return in those initial years, we have less charges if we're spreading that premium out. So again, this is a relationship between how we pay the premiums into these policies and how the charges are going to affect the end results, uh, uh, meaning that, you know, what that cash value is going to look like for our clients once we start taking loans out of these things. So here again, my other policy charges and fees, $1139.52. I've got uh, uh, $600 in, in premium charges during the funding years of 10 years. So a total of $600 times 10. We've obviously got six grand going in total in that first 10 years. And then uh, between $104 and $507 uh, in, in total COIs as it's increasing there in the first initial years. So let's kind of keep those numbers in mind here. I'm going to go back one more time, and I know I'm going back and forth, guys, but I think it's really important to see the relationship between these illustrations. I'm going to go back and put in my, my $20,000, and I'm going to show you this cost of insurance relationship here.
this is always the uh, boring part, guys. I know waiting for this uh, WinFlex web to catch up to us, but uh, nonetheless, we've got to let this thing calculate because it is, again, important to go back and forth when you're running these and really understand the, the, the effects of the different premium methodology that we take. And after I do this, I'm going to actually show you what happens if we took that hundred grand and funded it all the way until the point where we took the income out. So I'm going to go back into my system here now. I've got the 20000 in for five years. I'm going to jump all the way down to those COI pages. But I want to point something out. You see the initial death benefit? 382. On that 10 pay, our initial death benefit was $180,000. So right off the bat, we see a difference, or we should expect a difference in those COI charges. So here we go. We're at the COIs. So now we're double, obviously, in our premium loads. I put, I've now taken the $6,000 a year out, but I did it in the first five years. So this policy had a, a, essentially $3,000 extra weight in the first five years working against it, okay? So we got to keep that in mind. That's, a, that's reducing um, that early cash value and the momentum that it can take on a 7% rate of return. But also look at my COIs. Before I was between $104 and $507 uh, in the first 10 years, now I start out at 209, and by year 10, I'm at 962. So I basically doubled the range of uh, cost of insurance charges that are built into this policy in the first 10 years. And my other policy uh, charges and fees went from 1130 to 1850. So effectively, what I've done by funding the contract bigger up front is I've cost it a lot more money up front. Okay, and so again, we're, it's mathematics. We're, we're we're kind of working against. Uh, the uh, the grain here because um, given that same client that same 50 year old uh, we're changing first of all what the charges on the premium loads are and how much death benefit we're ultimately buying so again I've got three hundred sixty four thousand dollars of death benefit versus the hundred and eighty and change that I, I had uh, earlier there on the ten pay with ten thousand a year and that's going to change our results now it's not too dramatic because again I'm using a 50 year old I got preferred non tobacco so even though these costs change um, I have more premium up front that's working on the rate of return. So that's why we don't see a dramatic difference between the two. It's only about $171 or so. But um, nonetheless, there is a little bit more income that I got out by spreading those premiums out. Now, what I want to do just quickly in this exercise is I'm going to close out here real quick. I'm going to go back in, edit it one more time, and I'm going to show you what happens when I fund that premium all the way to the point where we take the income. So in this case, I'm going to go fund this thing. Uh, I'm going to try that one more time. I'm going to go fund this thing from age 50 to age 67. I'm going to put in $5,882 a year. That's just 17 years at $100,000. Um, I'm kind of rounding down there a little bit. And then age 68 to max, of course, while we're living on this thing, we're not going to put any more premium in. So I'm going to hit OK. And this would be the number that you'd be able to customize the IFL presentation with, by the way, because uh, as we know, we are not at a stage where we can skip premium years. Um, we, we have to, to use those calculators effectively and, and be um, you know, compliant showing a traditional apples-to-apples -apples scenario of a qualified plan. We would fund it all the way to retirement. Going to our disbursements, make sure we're still on board. Okay. And I'm going to hit calculate. And it's going to do some thinking. Oops. And a couple of good comments here, by the way, while uh, this thing is calculating. Uh, COIs would be affected by age of the client, absolutely. Um, so the older our clients get, uh, the more effect we're going to see on those COI charges. It's going to be more dramatic. You see less of this effect, and there's actually a crossover point, especially when you get into the clients that are in their 30s. Um, in those instances, the younger the client, the, the closer the bridge is between the two income outputs or the, the loan outputs because we're dealing with such a, a, a insignificant change in cost of insurance when we look at those two funding scenarios. But it will change more when you fund all the way to the point of, of taking the income out.
There's another question here. It looks like um, there's, a good, there's a good question here. I'm actually going to address this at the end, but um, worrying about uh, writing IULs with this uh, because if there is no interest credited then uh, what could happen, obviously there's no output, the, the policy would lapse, there's no income to be taken. Uh, if, the, if the policy continued to perform at zero, to combat it, the, this individual has been uh, allocating clients' money split between fixed and indexed account, usually an 80-20 split, to try to uh, put enough into a rate of return that's going to keep the policy in force. Uh, is there a better strategy or do products have a floor greater than zero, so on and so forth. I'm going to come back to that question, but I do think that's a really good question. Um, uh, as it as it goes along with um, kind of the rate of return that I'm using here in this this illustration option, so I'm going to come back to that one. But let's take a look at this illustration since it's ready. Um, our target premium is two thousand four hundred ninety-five dollars because we're putting fifty-eight eighty-two away a year, and look at our income it went down sixteen thousand eight eighty-six. Okay, so there's a there's a significant difference here in what actually occurs because although in this example, and I'm going to jump all the way down so don't get dizzy, uh, when we get to the takeout page, yes, we've significantly decreased those premium expenses, but we've increased the number of years that they're going to be on the policy. In this case, the premium expense charge runs all the way to 867. So we scroll down to our totals. We've taken out 58,626 in charges on this particular individual. Our cost of insurance is going to start out low because we've got 107,000, but remember we used an increasing debt benefit. So by the time we get to the end of our premium funding stage, our COIs are about the same of the $500 as it was in that uh, five pay scenario uh, because we're dealing at that point with the $278,000 in net debt benefit. Um, we see also that um, our other policy charges and fees uh, have spread out over a longer period of time. So by spreading the premiums out past that 10 pay, essentially what I started doing is although I was reducing the cost of the contract, I was I was creating the cost for a longer period of time, which meant that every time that policy was credited at 7%, there was something coming off the top of it. And that again comes back into our compounded interest side of things. So uh, there's, there's, you know, some interesting scenarios to be taken away from this. First of all, um, you, we encourage you that if you have a lump sum of money, run the different scenarios. Typically between five and seven pays, uh, you're going to see the most income coming out because you're going to massage the policy to the extent that you're, you're taking uh, and applying a, a sort of a peer interest crediting to the, to the policy once you get past years 10 and 11. And with Genworth and North American specifically, keep in mind that they have that 75 basis point bonus, if you will, that hits the policy, or which is essentially can be looked at two different ways, a reduction in cost or a bonus on, on the return. But either way, it's adding more juice to the, to the policy. And if, at that point, you don't have extra charges going in with that premium expense and the other policy charges and fees, then you're going to get more bang for the buck. You're going to get a greater value in that compounded rate of return. So it really does come down to the mathematics in this for you. But as you can see here, um, in this example, we would not want to encourage our client to fund uh, on an ongoing basis because it's going to reduce that income. We would probably suggest to this particular client that they stick with a 10 pay scenario and or a, a, a 5 pay scenario given that those two incomes are so close to one another. So what I want to do is I'm going to go back to the top here and I just saw a couple of questions come in. I want to go back and, and address these now real quick. One of the questions was um, please comment on starting at level versus increasing death benefits. Is it always better to do increasing? Not necessarily. You know, depending on the age of the client, really, is when you're going to see uh, significant differences between starting out with an option B versus an option A death benefit. And there's different theories out there. You know, there's, there's uh, those that would argue that option B, because it creates an additional cost of insurance exposure, is not necessarily always the right option. Um, and, um, um, you know, there's people that believe that we, because we're selling life insurance, we should not be finagling those types of numbers. Um, you know, that's, that comes down to kind of what your core belief is as a producer and what you think is right for your client. But if you take a look at the, the difference, and, and I'm going to keep it funding this way. I'm just going to go back and show you what happens. So keep in mind we've got 16, 8, 886 uh, in income here coming out or in loan value coming out at age 68. 
at a 7% rate of return. I'm going to go back here and I'm going to switch this. I'm going to click edit. I'm going to go into policy options. Let's just leave this always at a level death benefit. And let's calculate. So we're going to see a change in what the output is. We're also going to see a change in that cost of insurance structure, again, because it doesn't accelerate uh, quite like it does on the option B, which means we're going to keep some of that cost down in the initial years in that policy. But also we're going to have a significantly lower or potentially significantly lower death benefit, again, depending on the age of the client that we're running here. In this example, we're using a 50-year-old, which is kind of the mean uh, in terms of ages that we see uh, index universal life sales being, being done with. I'm going to let that calculate here. Uh, keep the questions coming, guys. These are great. Um, or other things that you'd like me to cover. Uh, one question, what are the negatives in running disbursements to age 100 versus max? That question is a good one, uh, Scott. That actually uh, depends on the carrier. Some insurance companies have a cost of insurance structure that's significantly reduced to the tune of like $100 a year after uh, somewhere in the 90s going into the age 100 range. And so what I typically see, like, uh, uh, Denver, for example, is their cost is so low in the later years of the contract that uh, you don't see a huge difference between taking income at 100 versus 120, although you certainly can uh, solve for that to squeeze out a little bit more in the policy. So if you take this person to age 100, you should typically see a little bit more income coming out of the policy itself. Um, but that said, um, in some instances, if you have a, a longevity for a client, you may not want to run the risk of just solving to 100. You might want to show them what it looks like going all the way to 120 um, because it could make a difference for your client. So here you see that uh, my initial death benefit at 240, it's levelized. I lost a couple grand in the deal. So on the initial policy distribution at the same rate of return, by using a level death benefit, I went from 16,886 to 14,465. But I'm going to go down here to the death benefit page, and again, forgive the, the amount of scrolling. These illustrations are quite long. Um, we kept that same funding scenario. We go down into our later years. Look at this death benefit, okay? So we've reduced a lot of costs on the back end, but we also have a, a lot less death benefit working with us. And so um, when we get to the point of life expectancy, let's say here at age 85, this client has you know, in, for many years in a row, uh, only about 80 some thousand dollars of death benefit left over. So that's part of what you're going to see as a result of running that level. Um, you lose a little bit of that internal rate of return story. Um, however, as you can see on the COIs, uh, things change significantly. Your fees go down. To go answer that question before about what happens uh, uh, in the later years, this is why generous policy looks so good, regardless of whether you run it at 100 or 120, Scott, is that at age 95, your cost of insurance charges disappear. All you have is this $112 a year fee going all the way to 120. So you get a little bit more value and you see an acceleration at this point. You'll see this is sort of the tipping point of the low point of death benefit. It really starts to take off. Uh, your net cash surrender also therefore starts to really accelerate, which is what gives it such uh, capability to produce uh, a lot of income in the later years without taking too much drag on the policy and or creating a major difference between what the income would look like at 100 versus uh, going to 120. Now, this is not always the same in every policy. Like I said, it's different for different carriers. Uh, so you're going to want to run that scenario based on those insurance companies and, and uh, just kind of pick the one that works best for your client if you're doing a age 100 solve. Fantastic questions, by the way. Uh, let's see what else we got here. A really great comment here, Bill, um, and that was something that I was going to allude to. So um, you would see a little bit of a boost if you took that $100,000, and there's two things you can do with it right now with these insurance companies. You can put it into a SPIA and do a 5-pay or a 7-pay or a 10-pay out of a SPIA product. Um, you know, by doing so, you're effectively uh, – uh, adding a little bit of a rate of return to the $100,000, therefore getting a little bit more uh, cash put into the policy. Um, taxes aside, we'll, we'll leave that co conversation for another day, but um, SPIAs are pre paying pretty low right now. It's not going to be a huge number. Uh, again, depends on, on the age of the client and, and uh, what we're trying to accomplish, but you will see a slight increase of income because you're going to get a little bit more bang in there. 
Um, kind of a side note for Genworth, they're one of the only companies that will actually let you use their SPIA to fund their own policy. And very rarely do, will you see an insurance company do that. They tend to not want to fight against uh, morbidity and mortality. But uh, you will see uh, Genworth being a company that would support that. In fact, they would actually send a premium check over to the other side of the house to pay the policy so your client doesn't have to do anything. Um, also, we have carriers right now. Allianz is a good example of this and a handful of others. ING has a fantastic one. Um, they have a side fund. You can put the $100,000 in, they'll give it a 2% rate of return or 3%, I believe, with ING, or which, who is now VOIA, and uh, they'll actually give you a decent rate of return on the money and internally fund the policy over time as well. So they'll take $100,000, they'll put it in for 10 years and uh, uh, add a little bit of a rate of return to the money. So there's different ways to maximize the value of that single pay. Uh, great comment, Bill, because that's absolutely dead on. And in some cases, it could result in enough uh, of an increase of income that it's going to make a lot of sense for your client. Let's see. Let's, let me look at some of these other questions here. I think I just answered this one for you, Chris, so uh, shoot it to me again if I didn't, but it was kind of along the same lines about, you know, is it best to take the client's money out of their checking account or money market, or is there some way to take that single pay and turn it into a little bit more of an effective approach? And again, it depends on what they're earning on that money now. If it's exposed to any volatility whatsoever, get it away from that, because if our intention is to take $100,000 and turn it into what we're showing our clients here, which is a tax-free uh, loan base, uh, uh, stream, then what we're able to do is, is secure that cash, hopefully at a decent rate of return, uh, to make sure that it's protected and they can't lose it along the funding process. If that money is exposed to any risk whatsoever, then the plan's not going to come to fruition because if they lost 30000 of the $100,000, and now we're only shoving seventy into this, the income's not going to look the same, and it's going to mess up the game plan for the client, especially when we're getting into the income planning process where we might be solving specifically to – uh, try to accomplish a particular goal for our clients, both in debt benefit and, and loan value. Um, I'm going to jump back into the question that uh, was asked by Alex there. Um, great question. What happens if the policy doesn't perform at all? Uh, there's that concern about these, these IULs where if we fund them and we get 10 years of a zero in a row, it, it's certainly going to last. It's not going to be able to support any sort of loans. And uh, we're, you know, you know, are we throwing our clients money away or putting them at risk? Then there's a theory of using the balanced allocations where you do a little bit in the fixed account, a little bit in the indexed account. What you have to ask yourself is, um, are, do the mechanics of an indexing strategy really make this possible? And we actually answered this question in our, in our road show. It was a really great question. We had some good answers. Uh, Charlie Gipple actually did a great job uh, answering this question. But um, here's the nuts and bolts of it. First, if you believe in indexing, then you would, you, you would probably not want to uh, take away the potential for that allocation to fixed to max perform in those years where the cap's going to be hit. So the, the, the purpose of those reset strategies is to start over again, if you will, at a value of the S&P 500 in this example 12 months from now. And so if we have a down year in the market, and if we look back historically, we see that there's rarely a time where there was more than three or four years of down uh, cycles in a row in the S&P 500. And also keep in mind, depending on the month you buy this policy, it could, it could be dramatically different for your client. You know, if that theory holds true and you take even zeros in the first one, two, or three years on the, on the rate of return, the next several years historically have shown us that the bull market return would max the caps out for your clients in those subsequent years. If that's the case, you're still going to have a decent average rate of return in your policy. And in those years where there was a rebound in the market, if you had money allocated to the fixed in, uh, interest strategy, you potentially then lost out on 20% uh, that could have been credited, in this example, 14% uh, index rate of return. So, you know, there's, there's, there's that theory out there that those balance allocations could be the safe haven, but keep in mind in the years that those caps are maxed, you're losing that 20%. Uh, gaining such a huge interest rate because right now fixed interest anywhere between three and say four, four and a half percent um, is is not going to look as good as 14 percent being credited at that at that point. Now I have in some years and I, and I like to really closely monitor the policies that I write. I've done a little bit of balance allocations for clients, but that was based on the type of um, client that I'm dealing with. 
you know, we, you have to read your client, you have to know who your client is. Um, and again, this is sort of theory or opinion, if you will, but if I'm sitting across a client that's so conservative and scared to death of loss that I think even a zero might freak them out, and, and, and if they see a zero in the first one or two years, um, they may decide to walk away from this, this opportunity, that's going to change things up for us. I don't want my client to, to lose hope or lose faith. So in that instance, I might allocate to fix. But I got to do my job and make sure 30 days before my policy review with my client, I'm prepared to reallocate back into the index if I see a bull market coming my way. And I've got to be sharp. I got to understand how to, how to read those signs. Um, I could be wrong. I could be right. At that point, you know, I'm, I'm I'm helping my client make decisions on allocation, and I'm carrying the the risk of being wrong and reallocating their their principal at the right time. So, and and that's the mistake I think most people make in these 401ks, these qualified plans, is we're never in the right funds at the right time. You know, you want to be careful not to make that mistake with these indexes or, or with balancing these indexes. Um, if you have a client that, that understands that you're removing them from risk by taking them out of the market um, or exposure or taking them away from volatility and that they're actually working with this index to try to maximize performance and they're comfortable being sold on the fact that they might just get a zero in the first one or two years, but that's a good thing then I wouldn't blend it. I would go with the 100% allocation of the index, let the policy do what it was built to do, and give your client the opportunity in those max cap years to get the full bang for the buck. Okay. So I know it's kind of a two-sided answer, but again, these are the, this is the stuff about index universal life that nobody really explains is a lot of times it comes down to personal opinion, what the risk tolerance is with these clients, you know, how they, what their point of view is, why are they looking at this, why are they considering this as a supplement, and you've got to make those those choices on the fly. So you're not going to do it the same way every single time. You're going to have to make some decisions based on uh, who you're dealing with, what the timeline looks like, and what our ultimate goal is. Some other questions came in here. Let's see. Uh, How uh, do you work this with qualified money? Uh, how do you do the withdrawals? Um, this co conversation came up as well, and this is another one of those opinion type things. And and this comes with its caution disclosure. You know, when you're dealing with converting qualified money, you just entered into a serious tax situation for your client. So you've got to be very careful. If you are not a certified uh, accountant, you're not a CPA, you're not uh, a tax professional, then you're walking a fine line in in, in telling somebody or showing somebody how to convert qualified money into a non-qualified asset. So um, my personal opinion, based on the age of the client, something I would do myself, I would convert qualified money into an IUL, well, absolutely. Um, but that's, again, based on uh, somebody in their mid-30s that's, that's uh, very much a believer in these products and how they work, and, and, and I understand how they work. So. I'm willing to take the risk and the exposure of having to pay taxes up front to convert my qualified money and, and to get into uh, to an IUL. Now, also in your in your uh, 401k, for example, there's limitations. Can you get access to the money? If you do have access to the money, are you comfortable with not just taxes but the the actual penalty that will be involved in converting that cash? Um, but if you consider the Roth IRA conversion concept. Um, it's the same type of principle. So the way you would handle this with qualified money is very much the same. If you had $100,000 of qualified money, you would fund this policy, um, and you would show your client the funding methodology. If you get into too in, uh, intricate of a tax sort of analysis saying, you know, for every $10,000, you got to hold back $3,400, uh, you're running a risk of actually giving tax advice. So what you would do is you would show your client that, look, if you took $100,000 of qualified money and you put $10,000 a year to this policy, here's how it's going to go. Just know that in doing so, you are now exposing yourself each and every year that you take this money and or that you convert this qualified account uh, into a non-qualified of having that risk of taxes and penalties and additional uh, uh, drag on the cash that uh, I encourage you, Mr. and Mrs. Client, to talk to your financial or tax professional about. So you've got to make sure that you're running that disclosure in there if you're dealing with qualified money because you do not want to be educating your client on the tax side of what they should or should not be doing or what they should or should not be holding back. Uh, potentially, you can um, see that some tax professionals would suggest using other assets to pay the taxes uh, on, on converting that qualified plan. Uh, some would advise you to hold back some money and put less in. Uh, leave that to the tax professional if you're not one.
Let's see. Okay, yeah, I've got actually, there's quite a few questions here, and this is really good, you guys, uh, as far as um, looking at qualified money. We've actually got a presentation that we recorded uh, from our road show that I will be sending out to all the IFL members where we had a couple of good people, a couple of good discussions about converting qualified money and, and different strategies to do it. Um, I will uh, uh, quote actually one of our, our top producers' uh, uh, suggestions, and I thought this was a really good uh, uh, approach that they took. Uh, essentially what he said was, you know, I partner up with the state planning and tax attorneys, and I let them come in with us and start doing that type of planning so they can make some suggestions to the client, what's appropriate, what they can afford, what their effective tax rates are, so that the mathematics are, are handled appropriately when you're designing the insurance policy and that you're distancing yourself from that tax conversation. Uh, but if you got clients with millions of dollars, in, in some cases, of qualified money, and they are... Uh, not happy paying taxes, and, and, they're, and they have enough time to make back the penalty and or to, to earn back what they're potentially losing up front in that conversion for taxes, then, then you know, it's, it's, it, it's something to take a look at. And if you are disclosing, again, appropriately to make sure the client understands that you aren't advising them on how to pay these taxes or how to deal with the taxation issue, but you're simply showing them what the money looks like if it was performing in a life insurance contract, then there's absolutely a market there. It's a huge marketplace. There's over $3 trillion in 401k money alone. Just make sure that you're not advising your client on something you're not licensed to do so with. Um, do you have any software to compare IULs versus annuities, CDs, IRAs, mutual funds, etc.? Well, uh, Wayne, good question. You know, the, the IFO calculators, first of all, can handle any type of qualified money if it's funded, you know, using that sort of uh, traditional funding methodology, you know, from, from point A to point B and then income. Um, so IRAs would be included in that, uh, you know, uh, 403Bs, 401Ks, SAPs, that kind of stuff. Um, if you want to do a direct comparison to an annuity, a CD, or a mutual fund, uh, the North American software and some other insurance companies as well, and we also have direct access at a discount for you if you're interested, there's a software called Insmark, and uh, they actually have the ability to make those side-by-side -side comparisons uh, to those types of accounts. Um, you know, that's, uh, again, it's a, there's a cost to it if you want to just have the actual software on your computer, but if you're running North American illustrations, it's something that's uh, baked into the process there, and you can actually just click a button, and it, and it pulls the numbers out of your IUL, and you can make a comparison to like a CD or an annuity or a mutual fund if you're licensed to do so. Um, another great comment by Bill, and in fact, this is going to be the subject of the next Wednesday training. So Bill, I think uh, you and I are in sync here. You're, you're, uh, you're teeing me up perfectly for this stuff. I, I owe you one. Um, you can also avoid tax penalty on those qualified plans if you use a 72T and, uh, and or a 72Q, depending on the qualified versus non-qualified money. But essentially what that allows you to do, um, uh, you're, not, you're still going to have to pay taxes, but you're going to avoid that 10% penalty by using that, that equation. The 72T is a, it's a code that we're allowed to take advantage of, essentially uh, taking a systematic stream of payments if we retire before age 59 and a half. Uh, there's specific rules involved in it, and I'm not going to get involved too much today, but um, I encourage everybody, if, that's, if this is something on your mind, how do we help our clients avoid these penalties? What happens when I have somebody that retires early? How do we show them how to fund these policies? We're going to teach specifically, and this will be something that John Illich is going to run in a couple of Wednesdays on the next training call. We're going to do a presentation on 72 T's and how to, how to effectively calculate them and how to approach them and how to understand them and explain them to your clients. So, Bill, great comment. Um, that's something that we're going to teach next time. Um, at this point, guys, I've, I've hit my one hour, and I definitely don't want to go too long here today. So I think I've got just about every question uh, covered here. Hopefully you saw a little bit of a relationship in the software today, how to use it first and foremost, and then what happens when you go from 5, 10, and then to a total pay uh, scenario, and what happens when you go from uh, increasing on the optimal switch versus a just pure level death benefit what the effects are on those incomes given the rate of return uh, being static across the board. So I hope this was uh, a little bit helpful today. Uh, again, we want to show you guys how to use all these different tools. So if there's anything you want to see, learn, know, 
please send me an email, shoot a, a, a note to your marketer, uh, give us some feedback because we always want to make sure that these calls are helpful for you guys out there uh, to, to maximize your success. So uh, thank you again so very much. We appreciate it. I look forward to uh, uh, working with everybody and, and, and answering some more questions as we go here. So everybody enjoy the rest of their week, and we will talk to you next time. Thanks so much.